All right, guys, we are live for ICOM Canada's first hangout. My name is Ryan Dodge, and I'm a member of the board of ICOM Canada. And we're doing, we're starting this new series of professional development hangouts this year, um, in part to raise awareness for ICOM Canada, but in part to raise awareness about Canadians and museum uh, professionals in Canada that are doing some amazing work and and um, and and you know pushing the envelope in in our field. And we wanted to uh, launch this series with, um, you know, someone from one of the new museums in Canada. So we're talking today with Sarah Beanborg, who's the exhibitions manager uh, from the Aga Khan Museum. So say hi there, Sarah. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Um, so we've scheduled uh, about an hour today for our hangout. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that through Twitter. We're using the hashtag askicom.ca, and you can tweet at us. Our handle's on the bottom here by my name, uh, Icom Canada, and you can tweet questions there. You can also use the Q&A function within the Hangout Viewer. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, just click on the, on the Q&A section, and you can type in questions there. Um, feel free to, uh, to ask any question, and, and we'll get Sarah um, answering them right away as soon as possible. Um, but really, um, we just wanted to talk to Sarah today about about her role and, and what, what she does at the Aga Khan, and also a little bit about the Aga Khan. I know um, maybe people watching haven't, uh, haven't been to Toronto, haven't had a chance to visit the museum yet, so we're going to talk about the museum itself a little bit as well. But maybe, Sarah, um, you could start off by just talking a little bit about your background, uh, maybe your education and, and where you worked before and, and how you uh, came to be at the Aga Khan. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That's a great intro. Um, I uh, did an undergrad uh, Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and then went to Fleming College and did the Museum Management and Curatorship Program. And my internship from there uh, landed me at the Babashu Museum where I was hired out of my internship and then was there for 16 years uh, under various titles. Uh, partway through I went and did a Bachelor of Education so that I could get a, a better sense of how visitors learn, you know, tacitly or, or not in galleries. And then I did a couple years of night school and got my project management professional designation, which was a really interesting process and I think has helped me a lot. I've been an exhibition manager since 2003 and was an assistant curator as well at the Badashi Museum when I left. And I am delighted to be here at the Aga Khan Museum. I came in September of 2013. The building was still under construction a lot of incredible work had been done already on getting our galleries ready and post-construction modification ready. So when I came, there was a good plan in place, and I was sort of here to support that plan and implement that. And so we opened uh, last September. So I had been there for a year before we opened. And we've been open now about six months, and it's been a whirlwind. It's been very exciting. Uh, and so I actually feel like my time at the Shoe Museum really served me well for this position because in smaller institutions you end up doing many, many different things. And because this museum is brand new and it was a startup, there was no point in the journey where it made sense to say, well, I'm not going to do that. Or, you know, that's not something that my department does because getting the museum open was everybody's job no matter what. And so it was a really very cool experience and we're here and it's outstandingly beautiful. So we're at 77 Winford Drive, which if you are from Toronto, you know isn't the heart of the museum district. Uh, the site was fairly intentional. We share this, this location with the Ismaili um, Centre here in Toronto and we share a park. And so it's this big sort of campus where People can spend time in the public park. It's open year-round, and it's free to anyone who comes, and the museum itself, and then the Ismaili Center. So can I actually, Ryan, can I, to give people a sense of what we're looking at, can you show image number one, which is yes, the... Of course. Yeah, um, yeah and, and uh, I think I like, um, if, if you could maybe talk a little bit about the site as well while we go through the images, because... Um, I think it's, I actually kind of live in the area, um, and, uh, and, and you know, at first when I heard that the museum was going to go there, I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting, um, but it makes perfect sense to me. Um, 
My wife actually works across the street. <laughs> oh, does she? Yeah, she's in the buildings across the street. Here, I'm going to share that image right now. Okay. Can you see that? There it is. So we are at Winford Drive and sort of Eglinton and and uh, and the and Don Mills. And so Winford Drive is there uh, as sort of the smaller street running in the top third right hand side of the photo, and that's the DVP heading north with the thickest traffic there. Uh, and so it's a big site, and the reason it's here is uh, because previous to this, the Bata Limited building was here. It was designed by uh, Parkin and was a very beautiful building and was owned by the Bata family and the Bata Corporation. And there was also a gas uh, office, like a head office. I don't know if it was Shell or Esso. I forget. But the land was bought and it was determined that the Ismaili Center was going to go here. And then when Mrs. Bata heard that His Highness was, was thinking of doing a museum in Canada, the two of them you know, with many other people weighing in, uh, decided that this would be a great location. And so she sold uh, the the building to the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and the museum and the Ismaili Center are now here. So, Ryan, I don't know how easy it is to click to the next picture you have, which is the overhead shot. Totally. I love this image. Yeah. And this is, it's twisted. So before we were looking at it, so if people are looking at it, this, the, the photo has sort of done a 90 degree rotation to the left. So you see the Ismaili Center closest to us with the big beautiful sort of dome. And then the museum is across the park. And yeah, exactly, is that building there. And so what was once sort of an industrial park has now become this really beautiful cultural center. And I think as people come up, what's wonderful is that you can actually spend the entire day up here. We're linked to the PATH network, so you can come up through the bike trails and you have to cross Eglinton, but we're within that system. And the museum has a restaurant, we have a 350 seat auditorium, the Ismaili Center does public tours at different times of day, so that's something that, you know, if people want to come, they can figure out ahead of time if it's open. Uh, and, and people can be here for several hours. And so it is a little bit more of a destination location. And what's in between the two cent in, in between the museum and, and the Ismaili Center there in the middle where the, the trees are? Is there is there exhibit space down there or is that That's that's part of our public park and it's this really beautiful landscaped garden that was designed by Vladimir Jurovic. And it's got five reflecting pools and spaces for contemplation, really beautiful rows of serviceberry trees, cypress trees. Uh, and so this and then there's I think sage and all there's all of the plants have significance, mm -hmm. and uh, and that and we do actually have an open space, a green space out there that's data ready, so we could have events, festivals, weddings, uh, meetings outside under a tent, and so it's really an extension of both buildings, and we share it as a site. Cool. Yeah, and it's it's amazing. So the building itself was uh, designed by Fumihiko Maki, who's a Pritzker Award winner. And the Ismaili Center was designed by Charles Correa. So interestingly, the three architects worked really well together from all sort of anecdotal evidence to create this sort of three-party space. And the buildings look harmonious, but they're slightly different. So they clearly were designed by different people, but they really share a lot of sort of common aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume that they were done by by three separate people um, looking at this image. That's it's fantastic how that how that works together. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we you know we're, we're looking at the museum here. We're you know we talked a bit about you know the site and everything. Can we talk a bit about you know the mission, the vision for the institution? What you know what you guys are are, are looking to do as a new museum in Toronto and and you know why Toronto. Um, you know, just just maybe a little bit of that background. Sure. Uh, now, there's a lot of there's a lot of answers to to those many questions. So, because I haven't memorized our mission, I'm going to read it a bit. Uh, so mm -hmm. this sounds a little bit rehearsed. But the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, Canada, offers a visitors a window into worlds unknown or unfamiliar: the artistic, intellectual, and scientific heritage of Muslim civilizations across the centuries, from the Iberian Peninsula to China. So in simpler language, we're sort of presenting the arts of Islamic civilizations in historic and geographic diversity. So, and we're doing that in three ways. 
So we have these three pillars of programming. We have exhibitions, which are fairly traditional to museums. We have a really robust education program, so programming for children, for adults, for school groups. Uh, for we're within sort of within TDSB um, uh, that programming as well. And then we have a performing arts department because clearly art isn't simply material culture or fine art. It's music and dance and poetry and spoken word. It's food. It's you know art as a forum. And so the institution sort of lives and breathes that. So we've got this beautiful restaurant. We've got this beautiful theater. We've got our galleries. And then we've got the programming. So that you could come and, in fact, eat food from anywhere from the Levant through North Africa, uh, Middle East, uh, parts of China, see exhibitions of, of those places, then go see potentially an award-winning pipa player on stage, and so that you're really immersing yourself in it. And the central space in the museum, we have this beautiful atrium. And the whole sort of concept, architectural concept for the building was the use of natural light, so that light is always present in the building. And you know how hard that is for museums to balance, right? The ROM is, is, a, great build, is, a, is a good example of how that has worked out. And so um, it was, you know, this mission, His Highness asked for Mihiko Maki to make light a focal point without making it a problem in the galleries. And we have ended up with this great atrium. And so we've got open space in the courtyard, which was consecrated by a whirling dervish when we opened really beautiful space, open year-round. Um, and then we have got a you know, coffee center. And within that space, we also have one gallery that's always open for free. So that if you came up to go to a, a performance and you didn't want to go see the galleries, we do have an exhibition that's always open, and that's called the Bell Reeve Room. And it's a collection of uh, ceramics in a space that pay, uh, sort of pays homage to uh, His Highness's uncle and aunt, uh, Sajardin and Catherine Aga Khan, who donated a fair amount of the, the collection to the museum. Right. Yeah. And, okay, so that's that's a good segue to, uh, you know, uh, we want to get in to talk about the exhibitions and, and your role so sp specifically, but maybe we could talk a little bit about the collection and maybe how, um, where the collection comes from and, and you know, what it comprises. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we The collection is small but mighty. So lots of museum colleagues of mine have said, wow, you know, it's not a huge number of artifacts. We have a little over 1,000 pieces. But of those 1,000 pieces, we have got some of the world's most impressive pieces of architecture and art from Islamic civilizations. And a huge portion of our collection is paperwork, so paintings, manuscripts, folios, uh, Quran. Uh, and so we, we have got a lot of strengths and we've got a lot of pieces that the world would come to see and, and art historians would come to see. And so we are going to grow the collection over time. But we are also really interested in the dialogue between our museum and other museums. So we have our program combines contemporary art uh, with historic art, material culture, sculpture, audiovisual artworks. And so it gives us a chance to have this dialogue between all the many sort of declarations of art from the past 2,000 years. And, and that's interesting because our gallery space is a two-story gallery space. And so our main floor is where we house the permanent collection uh, in an amazingly beautiful room that was designed by a team in uh, France, uh, in Paris, called Studio Adrien Gardère, who also did Louvre-Lens and uh, the Cairo Museum. So Oh, good. Yeah, so this is our two-story. So you're standing up on the second floor right now looking down into our permanent collection where we have got some, some pretty permanent fixtures and pretty permanent stories that we're going to tell, but the artifacts sort of rotate all the time. And if you were here the day this photo was taken, you'd be standing up in what we call gallery, the edge of gallery two, which looks out over this cutout into the lower, lower floor. And it's our second floor where we host temporary exhibitions. And we do anywhere between three and five a year. And that's where we get a chance to sort of bounce between contemporary and historic pieces, three-dimensional, two-dimensional. Again, it gives us the flexibility to play around a little bit. And our mandate is wonderful because it's not limiting. So the reason why 
Toronto is such a great location for the museum is because the diaspora, the world, you know, the whole world comes to Toronto to live. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's an easy place to live, but it means that we can, we have got people from all over the world coming through and living here and also visiting museums. So with our mandate, since we're celebrating art from Islamic civilizations, there's no real limit to that. We can show pieces from sort of any time period, you know, after the seventh century through to today and, and dozens of countries that, that, that within the Vatican cultures. Cool. Yeah. Um, you touched on uh, three to five temporary exhibits per year. Um, I wondered uh, if we could talk about you know, how, how those, I mean, the, usually they're smaller than major exhibitions, so you know, it's easier to do more, more of them per year. Um, and you mentioned just about being a, a part of the community. Is there, what's the process for those temp exhibits? Is there community involvement with them? Do you showcase uh, you know, artists in the community? Um, do people approach you with exhibit ideas? Um, you know, maybe you go into that a little bit for us. Sure. Uh, right now, we have got many years of, of ideas sort of cooking. And so what's nice is we are we're sort of fully programmed through 2017 in our galleries. Because we're so young and because we are sort of the new thing on the arts team when it comes to art from Islamic civilizations, there's a lot of institutions that are keen to work with us. So uh, our opening exhibition, uh, other than the collection gallery, what the first temporary exhibition that we opened that we did partnerships with was called the Garden of Ideas, and it was contemporary art from Pakistan. And we worked with a curator that's half-time here in Toronto and half-time in Sri Lanka. And we worked with six contemporary artists who, who all sort of work out of Pakistan. And so uh, it was an amazing experience because, as you know, it's not easy to get art in and out of some countries right now. And I think there were something like 72 different lenders for that show. And so we sort of opened with a bang with that contemporary piece. And you asked earlier a really neat and really insightful question about the garden space between the two buildings. And we did use it as a space to show art. So we had Imran Kreshi come and do an, an installation, site-specific installation outside where he painted a garden in our garden. Wow, nice. Yeah, and then at night in his hotel room, he painted a diptych of himself painting a garden in our garden. <laughs> and so, so we, we are young enough to be able to be very agile and sort of play with those opportunities. And so, yeah, we are, we are, we are fully booked for the next little while. We aren't sort of reaching out to the Toronto community yet, although we are working on a temporary Cana contemporary Canadian show. Mm -hmm. I think that... Right now, the, the program that we are running of these two gallery spaces upstairs is so robust that I don't think we are yet seeking too much input, but we do have people sending in proposals and prospectus documents all the time, and that's really helpful to us because we can begin to develop those partnerships for 2018 and beyond. So, so it's kind of kind of like us here at the ROM, you know, we, we run on sort of a three-year time frame. Um, same idea at the Agacon, um, three years out. Good. Yeah, and it, it, like everything, right? You, your first year is really cemented. Second year is nice and in the hopper. Third year is a little flexible, and and you know the the to be determined starts to fill itself in, in ways that make it less overwhelming. Yeah. All right, so um, we're about twenty minutes in, and I want to take a little bit of a break, and just uh, we've got a healthy amount of viewers. Um, thanks for watching, guys, and I just wanted to remind you that we're open for questions. Please do ask us questions. You can do that by uh, accessing the Q and A uh, feature in in the YouTube viewer if you're watching on YouTube or a Google Plus page if you're watching there. Um, you can also tweet at the ICOM handle. ICOM Canada and use the hashtag AskICOM and uh, we'll get Sarah to answer any of your questions. Um, so Sarah, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, your background, a little bit about the museum itself, um, you know, the, the spaces that you're dealing with. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about the architecture, but I think um, I wanted to maybe uh, talk about the exhibit spaces themselves and I wonder if you could go into maybe were the architects, you know, were there any parameters set for 
the different types of exhibiting spaces, or did the architect just say, okay, here's your space? And um, maybe talk about some of the, the challenges with, with the space, maybe, and, and some of the, the areas that, you know, you mentioned the light earlier. Um, yeah. You know, uh, maybe some of the spaces that you just absolutely love, and, you know, the first time you saw it, you said, oh, I can't wait to put an exhibition in there. Right. Yeah, this is good. You've given me a couple, couple uh, tangents to jump from here. One of the first things I want to do is talk about the amazing team of people I work with because I came into something that had been in process already for two years. And so the museum itself, there was, a, I, you know, long ago, there was a council of advisors who obviously were big thinkers in the museum field who made a lot of the big early decisions. We're lucky because we have this really great relationship with a company called Imara, who actually was the consultancy firm who basically built the two buildings and the entire site. So they were in charge of the entire site. And it's uh, they, I think, scaffolded it forward in, in a really great way so that while they weren't museum professionals themselves, they were engineers and construction experts and project managers on a scale that I can't even imagine. And so they distilled a lot of voices, I think, at the beginning to get the, the buildings together. And then the architect, who has worked with His Highness before a couple times and probably will again, I think they have a really lovely working relationship. And so they, they I think, made a lot of decisions together. And the building is so beautiful and so... Uh, the decoration in the building is really subtle. Like, there's a lot of pattern, there's a lot to look at, but it's really gentle. It's not an aggressive building from the outside. Like it's funny on snowy days we play this game like ah spot the museum because it really sort of when it's really white outside the building just sort of soaks into itself. And inside that space, when people come, you'll see this really bright, amazing, active, loud, exciting atrium that that incorporates some of the architectural patterns. But again. You know, it's it's this great space where we can have events, so we don't ever really have to have that awful conversation about like, well, hey, why can't we drink red wine in the gallery? You know, because we've got this beautiful space for you to drink red wine right outside the gallery. So it's a huge success on many levels. There are some things that we inherited that weren't sort of optimal. So we did a bunch of post-construction modification. And again, a lot of that had been started. Uh, and sort of in process when I started. When I started, it was still a construction site. Funny enough, we were still in hard hats and high visibility vests on August 22nd, and we opened to His Highness and Stephen Harper on September 12th. So we turned it into a museum in about two and a half weeks. Uh, but we worked with Click Netherfield and Cubic Maltby to get our casework in place once that construction was finished. Uh, and so it really, all this amazing planning and all of these consultants and the management of the site by Amara actually really worked. And so there was a lot of stress, there were a lot of late nights, and there were a lot of moments where we didn't think we could hit our potential. You know, where you, you open an exhibition and you think, oh, that could have been better, this could have been better, that could have been better. And in actual fact, except for a few minor things, we really opened the way we wanted to. And so that is a huge success. Now, our galleries are these really beautiful spaces. The floor is Indonesian teak, and it is amazing. But funny enough, one night, late August, where we had been putting up some vinyl to cover some of the windows to bring the light levels down, which I'll tell you about in a minute, the guy who had been installing the vinyl, I brought in some old beach towels from my house because you have to use water to float the vinyl and then use a squeegee to get the water out. I realized at 10.30 at night that he had left the wet beach towels on this floor, <laughs> this teak, which is oiled, like it's not lacquered, it's oiled wood, and it's so beautiful, and I got, I leapt out of bed, and my husband was like, what are you doing? I said, I gotta go back to work, the wet towels are sitting oh. up. <laughs> and so, it's, it's, all the finishes are really beautiful, um, but we have to be careful with them, right? It's not polished concrete at the shoe museum, I had polished concrete floors that I could drill into, and drop heavy loads on, and this we just have to be a little gentler. Uh, that the, the reason why we were putting vinyl over the windows is because we have beautiful windows in the gallery space, which I think visitors always like to understand that they're actually not in a bunker, 
Mm -hmm. so, so I don't disagree with windows and gallery spaces, but we had to go from 9,000 lux to 50. And so for about six months, I was running these tests with different layers of 3M vinyl to bring the light levels down because we, sh we display this huge carpet. Like we've got this massive carpet by the window. We've got Quran right by the window. And so we decided that we would, instead of installing something super expensive, we would try with 3M vinyl. And so what we ended up with was a sandwich of three layers. So there's white opaque and then a clear UV filter and then a perforated layer over top that is our sort of logo pattern across these 26 windows across the entire vista and we got down to 48 months on a sunny February afternoon. So it, you know, with any new project you learn something new and I, I and remember the day I inherited the project and they said we've got to drop it by like 8,550 lux and I thought oh I don't know how to do that. But again this project had so many nice people working on it that I had resources to turn to. So, And then I didn't wreck the floor which was good. Yeah, because um, I, I wanted to show this other photo that you have here of um, the gallery space. I don't see any windows in it, but I was I was wondering that the other image we showed um, with that big carpet in the <laughs> in the middle of the floor. Like yeah. I was going to say, do you change that out every three months, or how does that you know how does that work? But I guess you just answered that question. Well, you know what's great is if you look in the left-hand side of the photo, so there's the little blue bench with the two white benches there. Right all along that edge, exactly. All along that edge is those 26 windows. Okay. So you can see that we've got some light on the floor, which is evidenced in front of those pillar cases there. You can see that's from a light fixture. Mm -hmm. But we get a really uniform wash of light from the windows. And in that other photo, which has, which is the one that you were saying you liked because, yeah, your bibliophile tendencies, mm -hmm. um, you, there are windows along the back left wall there, but because, again, we've put on this opaque vinyl, it just gives sort of a really warm sense that light is coming through, but it's, there's no direct light. And, and so... Actually, this is a good example because the consultant said it's two layers of frosted glass, really thick frosted glass. So it's not as though it were clear to the outside. So the consultants were absolutely correct in that we needed to bring light levels down, but it just wasn't enough. And you don't know until you test it. And so that our way of sort of solving it was to make it seem more decorative and, and to bring it down at the same time. Now, while you have this picture up, yep. I'll just point out our light track in the ceiling uh, it is a proprietary track and has an amazing array of heads. It's by a company called Light Lab. But it's every 12 feet and only goes in one direction. And then the other lines that you see in the ceiling, that's our air exchange. Oh, okay. And so we, our lighting system it's not very hard to overlight artifacts because every 12 feet we have a light track. So it actually helps us keep light levels low, but it gives us lots of sort of interesting challenges to figure out how we mitigate shadows, like every museum, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you'll notice in that photo we have anti-reflection glass in our cases, which is an incredible luxury. And that was a decision made by Prince and Mean partly through the process. And working with Cubic and Click Netherfield to make that happen, uh, sort of in a... In a in a bit of a rush timeline because it was it was not a late decision but it was a, a bit of a change partly through the process but when people come in they're actually have no trouble reading things through the case because a lot of our content is written so all right I'm just gonna stop sharing um, we do, we do, we have a question, um, uh, and we're, we're going to get to it in a second, but I wanted to keep talking about the exhibitions a little bit longer, um, because uh, we talked a little bit about the temp space, we showed some of the permanent galleries, but you do have, uh, I'm looking, just looking at the website, a few, it looks like larger, ex like special exhibitions that are running, can we yeah. talk about that a little bit for, for a minute, and then we're, we've got a question about... Um, uh, just about um, you know uh, education behind your your work. So yeah. uh, maybe just talk about the show that's on now. And yeah, I'd love to. And and those are those temporary exhibitions that I was talking about. Okay, okay, okay. We have about uh, twenty 
500. I always get this wrong because at the Shoe Museum we use we worked in square feet, and here we work in meters squared, and so I'm terrible at that translation. Right. We have about 5,000 square feet of display space on each floor. And so on the, on the ground floor is our permanent collection where we change fragile items sort of every four months. So paperwork, textiles, that sort of thing. And that large carpet that you saw there, we have luck, luckily because of our temperature controls being as good as they are, because of our light control uh, and humidity control, uh, we have that on loan for six months. And that is one of the world's largest sofa-bid carpets. And it comes to us from a private uh, lender in Kuwait. And so we will always have a carpet in that space, but we wanted to open with this very triumphant, really beautiful carpet. And what's wonderful is that that carpet platform is always under the cutout so people can enjoy it from above because a lot of carpets are really complex and it's hard to see them when you're standing next to them and they're elevated. So, so that's a space we'll always use there. So right now, if you were to visit the museum, you could see the Belle Reve room, which was that free gallery space with the, the ceramics collection. On our main floor, obviously, our, our permanent collection, which is from the Agricon collection. And we have an exhibition up right now called The Lost Dow. And this is a show that I was really delighted to be the lead on because my background really is in experiential material culture exhibitions where people walk in and sort of go, wow, I'm so immersed in this moment. Uh, rather than sort of fine art, which is a, a, an incredible learning opportunity for me now because I'm learning a lot about that. But the Lost Dow comes to us from the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, and this was uh, a collection that was found at the bottom of the ocean in 1998 by a sea cucumber fisherman who was free diving and found this abnormal mound at the bottom of the sea just off Belatung Island. And it's from a shipwreck that happened in somewhere after 875. The 9th century shipwreck had been down there undisturbed until 1998. Uh, he pulled out this perfectly preserved ceramic, brought it to the surface and said, oh my gosh, what have I found? And so it was, the whole site was sort of bought and protected by the Indonesian government and through some private donation funding. And the show came to us because one of the things that His Highness, one of the reasons why this museum has been opened here in Toronto is because Toronto is a great place to talk about the sharing of ideas, uh, materials, uh, product, all sorts of history, culture, art across time and across civilizations. And so this was a boat that had 75,000 pieces on it that were coming from Tang Dynasty China and were headed through Indonesia and through the Indian Ocean over towards the uh, sort of the opposite dynasty. And so it was headed there, it was headed to this empire where clearly you're not sending, your first boat's not full of 75,000 pieces. This is probably a route of exchange that is centuries old by the 9th century. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a super highway. It's like if, a, if a, a truck overturned on the 401 and stuff came out, at this time this sort of maritime silk route was in place. And we think about the silk route, we think about camels, and we think about silks, and we think about spices. And this boat just waited for people to find it. And it's an amazing, amazing space. And I love it. I, I love how the gallery turned out. It's beautiful. It's a celebration of that collection. And then you go into our second gallery space, which we've actually d divided into two shows. So we are going to see three temporary shows if you come now. And one is called Inspired by India, and the other is called Visions of Mobile India. So Howard Hodgkin is a contemporary artist uh, of British uh, birth who lives between India and Britain and paints these amazing contemporary canvases that are rich and deep in texture and color. And it's his, it's how he feels about India. He paints these canvases. But he also collects Mughal India uh, paintings uh, from the Mughal style in India from sort of 16th century through to the 19th century. And the collection is outstanding. It's, it's uh, you know, kings and courtesans and beautiful women and handsome men and, and elephants and, and birds and plants and animals. And it's these, these sort of beautiful paintings in their own right, but they tell this really rich story, obviously, of Indian artistic heritage. And so he collects these and they're cared for at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University. And so for the very first time, he agreed to let us display his own paintings next to this collection. And you can tell you walk in and you're immersed into the mind of the collector. 
because collectors are sometimes as interesting as their collections. So, there you go. Yeah, and so you mentioned uh, two things. <laughs> We're gonna we'll get to your question, Keely. I'm sorry, um, but I just there's something I want to I want to talk about. Um, uh, you mentioned the Ashmolean a little bit, and uh, I know your boss, um, Dr. Kim, um, uh, used to be at the Ashmolean and was involved in the Ashmolean's redesign. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I was lucky enough to go in 2010 uh, during my master's, and 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 uh, Dr. Kim gave us a great tour and talked about, um, you know, uh, their narrative at the Ashmolean and how they're connecting different cultures throughout history. I thought that was a brilliant way to display objects and and to really organize around a museum. So I'm wondering how involved was he in bringing the your your opening sh that show, um, the Last Dow, to uh, to it sounds it sounds right up his alley. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I'm lucky because we are a, a museum of many strengths. Uh, but uh, my direct report, who is Linda Milrod, she's the head of exhibitions here, she was the director of exhibitions and collections at the AGO. And she was the senior project manager for program and design for transformation AGO. So she's my department head. She's awesome. Uh, and then I've got uh, one of my colleagues, his name's Simon Barron. He's our installation and exhibition coordinator. And he comes from BAM Productions, which is its own amazing sort of arm of, of museums and exhibitions and trade shows. And so the three of us are the exhibitions department. But then I'm in the lucky position that Henry, our director, loves exhibitions. So he loves museums in their whole. But you're right, he comes from the Ashmolean where he headed that incredible transformation. And so he just gets it. Like he understands how the visitor should have experiences. Uh, and so it's really wonderful to be in a place where exhibitions are celebrated, but also shared with performing arts and education. So everybody has a voice in this. So definitely Henry was instrumental in our relationship with the Ashmolean, but our curator uh, Phil is she she had her own relationship with the Ashmolean again because this is a fairly intimate field of art history and so everybody sort of knows each other and so we've got this this we've ended up with this really great net so we sort of it's like a dragnet like we're catching great ideas as we go and yeah Henry certainly was instrumental in making the the, uh, the Howard Hodgkins show come together but he also, yeah, as you said, the lost Dow also was something that he was very interested in. And and so as a shipwreck show and, and how cool that is for visitors to see shipwreck shows, uh, that was a big part of a, uh, of his decision to open that in our first year. Cool. All right, we're going to get to Keely's question. Um, sorry about the delay there, Keely. I, know you're, I hope you're still watching. Um, but it, it comes back to uh, your educational background, Sarah. Yep. And um, thinking about what you do now, um, she wanted to know um, how did you get your project management certificate, where you got it, and yep. how valuable you think it is. And, and if you think it's valuable for people um, you know, across the museum sector, not just uh, people that put together exhibitions, but uh, programmers and, and you know, uh, marketing people and, and all that. Um, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. It's a great question because people ask a lot, right? I'm sure they ask you too, Ryan, about how you end up where you end up. And, and museum careers are funny little beasts. Uh, I think most of us are just so delighted to get our entry level contracts when we start. And then you, know, you start to figure out what you're good at, what you care about. Uh, certainly for me, having a background in physical and cultural anthropology helps me a lot in understanding and being interested in the human story. The reason why I went and did my teaching degree, again, is because I wanted to figure out, especially in a city like Toronto, how to present information in nonverbal ways, right? Because people learn in so many different ways. So tactile learners, audible learners, um, visual learners, you know, and then the combination of all those. And so I, it's always been my interest to have exhibitions that fit those three personality types that go through shows. So the people who breeze through in five minutes, at least the color palette tells them something, the sound, the contextual imagery, even if they don't read an, a label at all, they get a sense of what they're looking at. Then those people who read just level twos and sort of immerse themselves in moments rather than reading everything. And then, of course, 
the, the, the audience we're always trying to get is people who read every piece of text and, and linger at every single artifact or art piece. And so for me, the teaching degree really helped me with that and to understand how people learn. Now, my PMP was a very different process. I don't, I don't often tell people they should go out and get it. It took a very long time. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's not easy. I, I, you know, when arts people go out for lunch and the check comes down, I was like, I'm not good at math, I'm an arts graduate. Uh, there's certainly, there's some of me in there. And so for me, it was an immersion in a whole new language. I had been doing project management in sort of self-taught ways for a couple years before I went. But it really helped me to organize my thinking. So budgeting, scheduling, uh, thinking about how to build teams, thinking about how to work with stakeholders, how to capitalize on sort of that stakeholder management skill that most project managers have but they didn't know. It's like having a babysitting job, you know, in many ways. So I'm very happy I did my PMP or my project management training and certification is different from your PMP. And then because I had academics as parents and they just said, you know, you go as high as you can, I decided to write my PMP exam, which was awful. Uh, I'm glad I did it, but I wouldn't suggest it to anyone because I don't think it truly matters. Like, I think that certification is probably necessary on huge projects, like, like this project, like the people who managed it, uh, you know, $300 million construction projects with dozens of service providers and stakeholders and councils and steering committees. I think there it might be useful, but for exhibitions and for other work in museums, I think if, if you want to do project management courses, definitely. But I don't know that you need to, like, grab the brass ring the way I did. And with PMP, you have to do constant professional development units. And I'm doing those in a way that I'm enjoying rather than trying to stay totally current because I don't think I'm ever going to go to one of the big banks and do a massive IT project. And so your PMP is kind of like buying a Lamborghini if you need an e-bike. Right. So it's more the, it's more the theory behind, behind yeah. the courses that's valuable. I mean, because, um, you know, I don't think there's... It's, it's very rare when you can work alone uh, on a project in, in the museum sector. You always have uh, people that you work with, groups, uh, working groups. So um, it sounds to me like the PMP stuff is, you know, it's valuable for the theory and how to get all those pieces uh, moving in the right direction, but maybe not going through and doing the exam at the end. I, I was looking at, the, at that. Uh, did you do it at U of T? I did, yes. I did it through the high school at U of T. And it was great because I could do it at night. Uh, like most museum professionals, I'm a lifelong learner. And so I was I was keen for new skills. I was keen for new challenges. I'd been at the Shoe Museum for a long time. And it was, you know, I was enjoying my job a lot. But I needed a bit of a challenge. And I certainly bit off slightly more than I could chew. Uh, but it was, it was good. It was really good. And at U of T, they have amazing instructors. They also offer it at Ryerson, at the Chang School for Business. Uh, and so it, it is, it is um, it's well worth it to learn the skill. And you're right. Learning that theory is, I think, what I actually needed and what I implement and what I use now. Uh, having the PMP after my name just is cool, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Yeah. Good question, Keely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, if you have any questions for Sarah, uh, you can, again, you can use the Q&A function if you're watching on YouTube or Google Plus um, and just type them right in into the chat box and we'll get to them. Or you can uh, tweet the at ICOM handle and the hashtag askicom.ca. Um, so Sarah, I think we've, we've kind of we've talked about, I think, a lot of the stuff we want to talk about. Is there anything else that... Um, that you wanted to go over uh, this afternoon, um, maybe maybe a little tidbit for um, some emerging professionals that may be watching um, that are you know just starting out. And you mentioned before how you know we may have an idea of where we're going to end up, but uh, you know sometimes our career path can take uh, interesting twists and turns. Um, you know maybe maybe if it, a piece of advice that you wish you knew when you were starting out um, something. <laughs> Run away. No. 
I I think that museum work is so rewarding because I don't you don't you don't by mistake land in museum work. It's a hard field to get a job in. Uh, it's a hard field to stay employed in. Um, but I do, I've never met a more dedicated group of people. I'm sure if I worked in nursing or something similar, I would feel the same way about my colleagues. But what I like most about museum work is that everybody went into it for that desire to have authentic learning experiences happen in public spaces that are accessible to all, right? And so for me, it was, it was a bit of a challenge. Uh, I, I loved museums growing up, but it was when I switched into anthropology that my dad said, oh, you know, how are you going to get a job? And I thought, well, I will get a job. I'll show you. And so it, it, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of luck. The Fleming program had just started a year after I graduated from my undergrad. Uh, or a year before, sorry, and so I did that in 96 and 97, which will hint at how old I am, and uh, and so that program was amazing because it was very much a vocational program, so there was a lot of artifact handling, we talked about everything you would need to know if you were in a small museum, and then how to ex sort of build those skills to work in medium and large size institutions, and I think what's great about the current programming here in Canada and in the UK and in the US is that almost all of the schools require students to do that internship. And that, I think, is where people really figure out how to shine and what to do and where to fit themselves in and how to capitalize on their strengths. And I think the one thing, the one piece of advice I would give to new grads or people who are sort of new in the field is to take every single learning opportunity, uh, help in every department, be on your social committee at work. Do those things that let you see how your colleagues do their jobs. Do a lot of active listening. Um, I don't know that you know. I'm sure Ryan, you've got the same tagline in your job description at the end that says "other duties as required," and that's almost 90% of your job. Because the other 10% you can do. Like you don't you don't need to learn as much about the stuff you're really qualified for. And that's where I have had the most dynamic and exciting times is in that other duties as required category because it's all around that central purpose of giving visitors like the best possible experience, whether they're visiting you virtually online or whether they are visiting your library, which I will, full disclosure here, this isn't my office, this is our library. Um, I, again, I just think Seize every moment and think about the visitor in all the things you do. Because at the end of the day, if you're not thinking about the visitor and about your academic responsibility to the world, I think you're in the wrong field. And so, I don't know, maybe that's a little too deep but, or shallow. No, uh, no, I, I don't think so at all. I think, I think it's good to remember why we're doing what we do. I think it's fantastic advice. Um, you know, uh, and and I, I appreciate you uh, laying it all out there. Um, I, I um, I'm I'm just watching our time here, and um, and I don't think we have any more questions. Um, no one's spoken up quite yet. So um, I think uh, if there's if there's nothing else that you wanted to add, Sarah, I think I think we'll probably end it for today. Uh, yeah. The only thing I think I would add is that. For anybody who feels that our subject matter here at the Aga Khan Museum is intimidating because uh, art from Islamic civilizations isn't something that is traditionally trumpeted in Western museums. You know, we don't go into art collections at other spaces and say, oh, look at all this Christian art. You know, it's, it's that we are self-identified because of our mandate as, as bringing together arts from all over these amazing cultures all over the world. But I want people to to think that this is a museum for them. This is a museum for learning and for excitement and for kids. I, I have a seven-year-old daughter who requests to come here with her best friends on playdates, which feels amazing. Uh, we've got this awesome family programming every Sunday. We've got these beautiful shows in our auditorium. There's not a bad seat in the house. It's like acoustically perfect, and it's aesthetically just a, a dynamite space. Uh, and we are programming these things that you know, you might open up the newspaper and say, "Oh, I don't recognize that band name," or "I don't know who that poet is," and so I don't want to go, or I, I won't know the basic information. 
But what we are doing is bringing the basic information in really joyful and really interesting ways. And I think to a T, our visitors are leaving. And sure, they're giving us lots of constructive feedback about what we could be doing different. You know, our font is never dark enough. It's never large enough. The lights are always too dark, mm -hmm. as all museums deal with. But the joy that people leave here with, it feels really good. And, and I, I didn't ever think I'd get to have that experience again after leaving the shoe museum again, because it, it's a it's a it's sort of a, a not a niche museum, but it, it's it's a it's a clear topic shoe museum. Uh, but people always said, oh, I never knew why I wanted to come to the shoe museum. And then when they left, they said, oh, I can't believe I've never been here. And I want people to know that that's exactly what people are having as experiences up here, and that's what keeps us programming our little hearts out. Amazing. So visit if you come to Toronto, visit the Aga Khan Museum. Uh, the website is agakhanmuseum.org. And Sarah, are you um, are you speaking uh, anywhere in the, in the near future? Are you heading out to the CMAs? Yeah, I'm. I'm going to be at the CMAs, and I am moderating a panel with some very good friends uh, from uh, from the ROM and from um, from BC and from Alberta. And so I'll be there just moderating the panel, which is the easiest job of all time. And, uh, and I'm presenting a case study for um, Megan and Xerxes at CMA about engagement misfires, because I've had a few, I will admit. Yes, fail, fail, fail easy, fail, or fail soon, fail fast. You fail often and learn from it and tell your friends, because all of us pretending that we don't make mistakes doesn't make it any easier for our colleagues. Um, every day, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and if people want to get in, in, in touch with you, if they want to follow up, how can they do that? Uh, you know what? I am. I, why don't I give you my email address? Should sure. I just say it? I guess. You it's, just say it. It's yeah. long. Uh, it's Sarah S A R A H dot beam b e a m dash b o r g at a k d n dot org. And also, if you Google me, I, it's a double-barreled last name that is nowhere else, so it's pretty easy to find me online. We'll um, we'll add that to the description uh, on the YouTube video once once the recording is posted on the YouTube channel. We can edit the description, so we'll add that there if you okay. if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, and I also, um, I want to give a shout out um, to uh, Christine Moreland. She doesn't know I'm going to do this. Um, she's sitting right beside me, and she's been instrumental in getting. Uh, this program off the ground. So I just wanted to uh, say over here. Hi, Christine. Um, Christine uh, has has been helping us, uh, ICOM, the ICOM Canada board, with this program. It's something that she, um, you know, really wanted to to get in, get involved with um, from an emerging museum professional uh, background, and, and and you know, we're great to have. The, uh, we're really happy to have the help. Um, uh, on the board of ICOM. Um, I want to talk uh, quickly about our next Hangout. It's going to be the first week in June. Um, we haven't nailed down a date quite yet. I'm pretty sure it's going to be June 8th, but I don't want to say that. We'll, we'll be out on our Facebook page and our Twitter handle with the exact details. But we're going to be talking to uh, Dr. Robert James um, on the next Hangout about uh, museums and uh, in a sustainable world. Um, ICOM International's International Museum Day in May is all about museums in a sustainable world. And you may know that Dr. Jaynes is an authority on the subject. He's written extensively on uh, museums going forward in the 21st century and what we need to do um, to be uh, a good uh, partner and uh, you know, a, a good uh, to move along uh, in helping the world become more sustainable. So, um, stay tuned for more details on that. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of all your busy schedules to 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 watch today. And and thank you very much, Sarah, for for being our inaugural uh, um, uh, presenter in in our Icon series here. Well, thanks, Ryan, and thank you, because uh, I was incredibly flattered when you wrote, and uh, and the fact that you have Dr. Jane speaking next is outstanding. I will tune in for sure, and I just really appreci that, pre appreciate that ICOM is interested in what we do and the behind the scenes, right? Because this is, this is stuff that often doesn't get talked about or trumpeted, so it's pretty cool to be able to talk about it. Thanks.
Exactly. We want to we want to talk about uh, all the amazing work that all of our Canadian museum professionals are doing. So, um, if you uh, do have an idea for one of these hangouts, if you want to take part, if you want to present, tweet at us, uh, write us a comment on Facebook, get in touch, let us know. Um, you know, we're we're really interested in hearing from you. Uh, you know, if if you think we did a bad job today and you want to you know tell us about it, let us know. Um, uh, we're open to any and all feedback, so um, we'll leave it there. Thank you again, Sarah. Um, you know, thank you everyone for watching, and, and we'll see you next time. Okay, bye. Bye.